Welcome, everybody, to episode six of the Big Ben and Friends podcast. I am Big Ben Ortmans, and this week I'm going to be getting to know one of my friends from the pro wrestling business a little bit better. Today, I get to speak to the most talented unsigned professional wrestler on town, who probably Earth. Uh, some say he's the most unsigned Canadian wrestler uh, that's not signed right now. I say he's probably the most talented wrestler that's not signed on the planet right now that's just maybe my personal opinion but uh to me he's the epitome of the word professional he is a taekwondo black belt who was able to transition that style into one of the most jaw-dropping fascinating hybrid styles of pro wrestling that i've personally seen he's wrestled damn near everybody and has wrestled damn near everywhere and to this day i credit him with helping solidify cross body pro wrestling as a place that both fans and wrestlers could take seriously He's one of the most passionate, humble, giving, and nicest human beings that you're ever going to meet. And he's someone who makes every place and person that he deals with better. It's a pleasure that I get to call this man a friend. He's genuinely one of my favorite human beings on this entire planet. Everybody welcome my guest today, Speedball Mike Bailey. How are you doing today, sir? Did you just no-sell that? <laughs> well, no. Um... No, there was a bit of delay. And now I feel really bad because that was so much craze. I barely know how to handle it. Oh, that's all right. Uh, it did no, say my internet you. connection is unstable there for a second. So thank I apologize. Uh, hopefully that was uh, – no this is going so poorly. First, this is take two, by the way, in case anybody knows, because uh, I, I have not been good at speaking English this morning. So let's just hope that uh, everybody caught that. Um, how are you doing today, man? Well – at least, at least this is take two of the beginning of the podcast. And so, of course, I've had a lot of free time. So I've been, I've been going around and, and I've been just accepting most like podcasters that come at me. And it's happened like a couple of times already where you yep. do a good hour and I, I shut it off. And I'm like, yeah, that was really good. I sounded all right on there. Like I, I made sense. And then I get a text saying, hey, so my, my hard drive ran out of space at minute four. Well. Hopefully we, we don't have that problem because if not, then I'm going to be really pissed because we're filming on Zoom and uh, if not, that's all Zoom's fault. So uh, thankfully it just records right to the computer and then I can just go from there. But yeah, uh, had a bit of a rough outing trying to introduce him there at the, at the start and uh, hopefully the internet connection is a little bit more stable so that way we don't run into uh, any more disasters, uh, whatchamacallit there. But I have, I have to, to ask again, you, how, how are things going, man? You've... Uh, You've obviously had a little bit of a change in pace of uh, how life's been going, just because obviously you were a, you were a busy, yes. busy before all of this stuff started to go down, and you're kind of just stuck right now, right? Yes. So, yeah, things are going okay for me. Um, the world is a crazy place. Uh, but, like, for the last few months, I've just been home, and I'll be home for another long time because I won't be able to travel which is usually how my life goes like my normal schedule uh, is i'll spend approximately a month in one place and then i'll have to move on and then usually like it's not even like i'll rarely stay i'll rarely sleep in the same bed for a whole week because i'm usually traveling three or four days and it's very rare but now i've been in the same place for the last month has that been which weird I've had, just, it's been super weird but also it's been nice like it was hard to adapt to at first. So yeah. um, I came back from, I'm taking so many detours to tell a very simple story, it's but good. I flew back from Japan uh, mid April, I think. So pretty late. So I had to full on quarantine for just, just in one room from ah, no contact right. with anyone else for a full 14 days. And then I thought, Oh, you know, I can't wait to go out after. And then 40 days came up and there was, there was nowhere for me to go. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's been a weird one, man. Like, uh, like I was kind of, we were just talking earlier before we hit record. It's just, it's, it's been a really weird time, like within a really weird time, you know? Yes. And uh, thankfully we've got stuff like this where we can catch up and we can still, you know, get our creative outlet in different ways, at least anyway. Yes. And I mean, I know you said that you're doing a lot of podcasts. Hopefully, you know, I'm going to try to switch it up for you and I'm not going to try to, you know, bug you about stupid details. Like, you know, uh, 
whatever. I, I, hopefully this is a little bit more of an open-ended, just kind of a, a cool conversation. And, you know, one of the biggest reasons why I got to, to even start doing this project was, again, to, to get to know my friends a little bit better. And this was one of the questions that I prefaced to you before we started to, to do this interview was, um, do you remember how we met and how we became friends in the first place? So, yes, I remember. And I'm sure you remember, too, because there's an actual story behind it. So yeah. I, it was at a show on a Friday, I believe. I did yeah. a show in the Maritimes on a Thursday, and then I flew down to Toronto area for a show on a Friday. And I had other bookings in Toronto Saturday and Sunday, so I was spending the weekend. And then I had a match that Friday, and then, like, Immediately after my match, you went up to me and asked, I have a show tomorrow afternoon. Do you want to be on it? And I was like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, like, I felt like I was, I was just all in for that weekend. So why not? Yeah. And yeah, I think yeah, I, like, I, I remember coming down the next day and I, just, I saw your, your setup with the school, I, I think, that hadn't been open for very long. Not, not that long yet, no. Not that long. No, this was in the first couple of shows right yeah it was like I, I can't remember exactly what number show it was but it was very early on uh, the one where the, the first one that you came down to do um because we started in uh no october october 1st was our first show and i can't remember which one it was it might have even been the second show actually now that i think about it um because the the one that you came down for uh, that was like the match that, you know, really helped put our company on the map was the match with you, Tyler Thomas and Alessandro Del Bruno. And mm. that was a family day feud, which was February. So, right. um, there must've been, I, I, again, I can't remember how early on it was, but I, here's what I remember about that day, which is just kind of funny enough is I always knew who you were and, uh, I just knew that we had never met before. And obviously when you, you went out to wrestle that day, cause we were both uh, booked on that, on that card. And I had the weirdest spot that day. I was filling in for somebody because Rob rage uh, needed a tag team partner. So I, it, I, I, I walked in as a tag team champion uh, and the belt was just given to me. Okay. Great. So me and Rob win the match. And then they take the belts from us. It was the weirdest booking. Uh, but I just remember watching your match out there. And I was just like, oh, man, like, I, this is like my kind of guy. Because like, you were just very kick heavy. And I remember walking up to you. And I was just like, hey, man, yes. I'm Ben. We've never met before. But I really hope that one day you and me get to kick the shit out of one another. Because it looks like a lot of fun. And you just looked at me. And you just kind of smiled. And you're just like, that does sound like a lot of fun. Yes. And then like, we just kind of, we were just like, all right, cool. So um, the next thing I know, we just started shooting the shit. Next thing I know, uh, I brought up the show and, and you came down with uh, Sonny Soleil and other Buster guys. Burrell? Yeah. Buster Burrow. Buster Yes. Sorry. Buster. Sorry, Buster. So they, yeah. Um, they're both, they were both IDBS uh, wrestling school students. Uh, yeah. Sonny Soleil still wrestles. Buster Burrow has, he's either taking time off or he's, fully stopped i'm not sure but he's not currently wrestling anymore okay that makes sense just because i haven't heard from him for for quite a while i would have thought that i would have uh but yeah you, you guys came down and tore it up and it was one of those uh funny situations where i remember like advertising you the day of and it was like i i feel like you run into this situation a lot where like you'll go into a new place and you'll come out and everybody's looking at you like who the fuck is this weirdo? And then next thing you know, like within two minutes, they're just like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> like it's, it's a very, it's a very fascinating uh, switch to watch happen just because it happens so goddamn fast. And then, yes. Uh, yes. And that is one of my favorite like places to be in professional wrestling. Like I love, th that's one of the things I've learned over time. And like, especially with the way I looked or probably less now but more than when I was smaller and had like a lot less I, I don't know not that I'm a big muscle guy but you know I'm better than I was um no one knew me I came out with my taekwondo uniform and then that would usually get a if no one knew who I was that would usually get a very like what's this guy doing here reaction yeah. from the crowd yeah. and 
one of my favorite things was like being able to start the match with people like che almost cheering for my heel opponent because I didn't look like I was a threat at all and then rapidly switching that around and people being like whoa that's one of my favorite things in life and in pro wrestling I also love love that yeah and you know the the, the funny thing is is uh if you go back and you ever watch that match on YouTube, and if anybody's watching this, go look that match up on the Crossbody uh, Pro Wrestling Academy YouTube page. It is, it's, it's fascinating to watch uh, from two different perspectives, like just to watch the match in general, because it's, it's mind blowing. I remember uh, a couple of wrestlers were about to head out uh, as the match started. And I remember like, as they were like, Hey, see you later, Ben. And I remember screaming at them. I'm like, you guys are fucking idiots. If you leave right now, um, because the way that the match started, it was like, it was so hot. Like, and it was one of those deals where, um, because I don't know if you remember how you started it, but like uh, they went to go and have the belt and then Tyler grabbed the belt from the ref and pegged Alex and then went to go yeah. and hit you. And then like, you guys just like went into it. And then like you started with like the, the springboard moonsault into the outside, rolled them right in. And then you went for that fucking crazy splash that you do. Um, and and I, so it's, it's mind blowing to watch again as a fan, but then when you watch everybody else's like reactions, like sitting in the audience, it's the funniest <laughs> shit in the world to me. Cause at one, there's even my buddy, Josh, who just sits there and he's just like, he, he like pats his friends on the shoulder, like so many times. And he's just like, this guy's fucking great. <laughs> and like, you see him say it and he's just like, all right, I'm sold. I got this, like, this guy's great. Uh, and you just, it, it was just so cool to see different uh, people. Like there's even one kid in the back row who would like stand up and just like faint, like after like some of the stuff that you were doing. And uh, it's just, it, that was amazing, dude. Just because again, getting to show that match to everybody. Cause like the, our building had never experienced that type of energy before. It was absolutely insane. Like, just because it was – here's why that match was super important to me. Just because I was really – like, when I started the company, I really wanted to focus on, like, an independent style, like a hard-hitting style of, uh, yes. of, of pro wrestling. Right. The city of Kitchener was not used to that style whatsoever. The other company that runs shows there run a much different <clears> – <throat> much different way and they have a much different philosophy of how they run their business. Yes. Cool. But that, the unfortunate part for me was that, uh, that was that, that's what that audience was, uh, brought up with. Yeah. So they didn't really know much, uh, much difference. So oh, the no. biggest, yeah. So the biggest struggle for me when oh. I first started was getting people to kind of accept this new style and, uh, and like just be getting people to show up just because like you would, I, I would hear like the rumblings of just like, Oh, these guys are just like, they, you know, the, the stuff that you would hear about like old timers talking about the young kids, you know, it's just like, ah, he's fucking high flyers and they're no psychology having blah, 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 like so, fucking whatever. I'll have so to, I have to apologize to your listeners because you're just slowly dragging me into that wrestling nerd part of the podcast where I just go deep into structure and everything and it's well, going to be real boring if you're not really interested in professional wrestling but I, every, I guess, anybody who watches this probably happen. knows me and is a student sure. or a wrestler anyway so i'm sure that they'll appreciate the education yeah but i'm sure that's something super important and i'll just go back to what you said like i know i know what i do and who i am as a wrestler and i know my skill level and like what my position is and i like i have no problem saying like i'm not the best like i couldn't do what randy orton does not even close to it like there's a lot of different tricks and long-term storylines and how to work on the road and how to build a program and like build a long-term feud i can't do that but in terms of having a good indie wrestling match i'm the best in the world at teaching that or doing that and I, i'll just say it like I'm, I, I know because I know. Like you're, in, you're not going to hear an argument from me, one, right? Especially in terms of teaching and seminars, there is no one in the world that is as good as me is explaining to people how to have a good indie wrestling match. And I can vouch for that uh, because you did a two day seminar with Veda Scott at our place, and both yes. before shows and yes. the the first night, 
you could just see the level of uh, the level of matches and just everybody's improvement from like the previous uh, Friday's show to the yes. th- uh, next Friday show that you, you know, had, had taught your seminar at. And you just see everybody, the, just the different structures change and you just see people's mindset change and just like, even just the way that they go about their technique change. And, you know, you and Veda got to wrestle with Blake 182 and Dickie Watts uh, yes. in the main event of the Showcase Series show. And the amount of growth that those two just in in one 15 minute match was mind blowing because not only did they get the education from you guys earlier in the day, but then, you know, they got to experience that firsthand. And like, I, I, Blake was, you know, Blake's an emotional kid anyway, but like he was in tears when he found out that he got to wrestle you just because like, you know, you're one of the guys that he really looks up to as far as indie wrestling goes. And so does Dickie. And uh, for those two to have that opportunity, especially driving down, because again, those guys would will always drive down from Michigan. And, you know, they're because of the way that the showcase series shows are designed. Uh, a lot of the times I didn't even know who they were wrestling until they got to the building, just because I like to kind of keep everything a surprise for those shows, you know? And then all of a sudden they drive down and, they're like, fuck, now I'm wrestling the best guy in the, in the, like, the best indie guy in the fucking world. What is going on right now? Yes, and, like, uh, Blake and Dickie, they're the perfect example of exactly what you're describing. Of, like, so to me, having a, a good indie match is all about choices, right? When you talk about that old school style, it's because usually you're focused on a lot of different things versus the key to having a good indie match is just to try to really isolate it and think to yourself, I'm given instructions by the booker, which is, let's say, a certain amount of minutes at a certain spot on the card with certain restrictions. What is the best match I can have with that? And in terms of have, like being a good independent wrestler, that should always be your thought. What, how can I arrange it so that it's the best match I can have with that? And there's a lot of like, very easy choices you have to make in order to accomplish that. Like um, thinking, (laughs) what are the coolest things I can do? Mm -hmm. And knowing what they are and then placing them in an order that it like, that everything is maximized and it makes sense. And like, that's, that's kind of what I try to teach the most. Right. And it's people that I see, like the people that I want to give seminars to, are the people that I see that can do really, really cool stuff, but either just do them sometimes or don't know how to make them mean as much as possible because then it's really easy for me to just kind of show them a structure or how to structure them and how to arrange things and place things so that you can have like a good, consistent indie match and that every time someone books you for a certain slot, they know that they will get the most out of that slot on their shows. Like that's what I've tried really hard to do for the last like, probably eight years since I really figured out how to do it. And like, I've been working at it for eight years and breaking it down for eight years. And that's really like why I think I'm successful as a pro wrestler. I would say so as well. And like, I mean, you're one of the guys that most young guys should, I I think they're intimidated by you when they first meet you because they see this guy in the ring who genuinely just kicks the shit out of people. Right. Yeah. Uh, And then they're like, Oh, I don't want this. (laughs) I don't want to, I don't want to piss off this guy. Like I, I know, I know people who, and I'm not going to drop names, but I know uh, people who have been around for like a long time who have asked me, they're just like, Yo, like, is is Speedball mad at me? I'm, Speedball's not mad at anybody, ever <laughs> that I've ever heard of. Like, I don't know him to be mad, and they're just. I'm like, why would you think that? And uh, I, I remember they're just like, wow, he just he was just like really intense, and he was just trying to like, you know, he's just telling me like, you know, blah 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 blah. And I'm like, no, that's that's called passion. That's that's uh, that's somebody who sees that you have potential and they're trying to help you and they genuinely, they just want you to, to get it. I was just like, did that, did that freak you out? They're like, yeah, I still couldn't tell whether he hated me or whether. And I'm like, dude, 
there, I don't think Speedball has a hate list. And if he does, he keeps that shit real tight to himself. You know, like you're the nicest guy. Like you're, so no. if it, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It, it like, honestly, to get me to be mad at, like actually mad at someone, it, it honestly takes a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly don't have a lot of patience for people who, like this, I know, I know that this sounds harsh, and I don't like, I, like honestly, I never get mad, I never hate anyone, but I don't have much patience for people who don't care. I like get you're, an, you're an independent wrestler. I'm get yeah, man. I'm gonna take another huge detour. Let's go. But, huge giant detour, but there's a lesson there, so it's important. Um, when I was competing in Taekwondo, I got my black belt at uh, 15, 14, 14 and a half approximately. After, after I was like doing very well, I got it relatively fast. It only took me like three years because I was doing very, very well in color belt competition. And so that kind of pushes you up the ranks faster. And then yep. I started competing in black belt with other black belts at 15. So I was doing very, very well and like doing well in competition. And I like, I worked my way up to my last, my last uh, season as a junior in taekwondo competition i was uh, second in canada i got i got silver in the in the nationals i was doing oh. very very well wow yeah but then when you move on to senior it's a very 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 like rough like adaptation because everyone that's 16 like they've been competing in taekwondo for probably not a lot longer than you have Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, it's, I'm 16 years old. I'm fighting with people that are 27 and have competed in multiple world championships and everything. It's a really, really rough like switch. So well, and, I remember and you're talking about a completely different like bone structure as well. And yes, like just a yes. completely different type of fast twitch muscle fiber. That's right. That's, that's, that's not also, fair. So the main, well, the main thing for me was just like, I could kick, I had long legs, which is really helpful in Taekwondo. Yes. As I'm sure you, you know. Um, yes. So, like, patience was always an issue for me where, especially if I was losing, I, was, I would attack too fast and too much and then get, get caught. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of my pattern that I constantly had to work on. But so my, I did my first uh, competition as an adult and it didn't go too well. And afterwards, my, my coach told me, um, you're 16. Taekwondo fighters usually peak around 26 or 27. You have a lot of time. Those first three years, they don't count. They're just practice. Doesn't matter if you win. Doesn't matter if you lose. As long as you care, you train as hard as possible, mm -hmm. and you like make the most out of every match and learn from your mistakes. And you know, it took me two or three years before I started, you know, winning and doing well as a as a senior uh, black belt in Taekwondo. Um, but I'm really happy he told me that those three years because it really took the pressure off and it really allowed me to step back and not get mad at myself because I was not, you know, I was not winning. I was not one of the best in Quebec yet. Right. And like that made me feel a lot more comfortable with losing and being able to identify why I was losing, why, why it didn't work and just care. And that's when I get mad at other professional wrestlers. Like 90% of the people I run across on indie shows you are getting paid less than $50. You may have driven four hours to get to the show. Like, I'm sorry, but most of the promotions where you wrestle, they only run once a month. Mm -hmm. There is no one from WWE watching your match. Like, people <clears throat> don't follow the storylines the audience is going to come back next month for another nine match card. And they're going to have mostly forgotten about you. Mm -hmm. It's all just practice. If you're not trying really, really hard and putting as much effort into having the best match possible that night, because you don't care or are being lazy, then you're wasting your time. And I have absolutely no patience for that. And I have no idea why you came to the show that day and took a spot from someone else who could have used it in order to care and get better. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, work ethic is, is huge for me. And I, I, I just don't understand. <clears throat> I, the, see, here's, 
I, I've gotten into this argument with a, with a friend of mine who I started out with, I'm not going to name him, just I'm not trying to put anybody on blast. Uh, but there was a gentleman that uh, we, we kind of got into a disagreement because he went and did a match and he wanted my feedback on the match. And he didn't appreciate the advice that I provided for him, but he didn't understand the advice that I uh, like provided for him as well, because the advice I provided was, I was like, Hey, listen, like the match was really, really good when the action picked up. But as yeah. far as, uh, and, and if that was on a, uh, like a, a, just a live event that, you know, isn't being taped for anything, or if it wasn't, yeah. if it was like a fair show, for example, or like, in a, an arena show in front of a bunch of people, you know, like that match would have been absolutely perfect. But sometimes you have to also understand your surroundings and what it is that you're doing. This was being taped for a television show. So in regards to it being a television match, it wasn't good because what you did was for this, I'm just going to say 15 minute time frame. Okay. You yes. gave me eight to nine minutes of dead air. What am I supposed yeah. to do with that? Yeah. Like, I, like I, as, a, as a producer, you know what I mean? And someone who's supposed to be able to, to like put all that together, how, how are you supposed to, like, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, that's the difference. And then he did not take that advice well. And almost as if like I had some type of, you know, as, as if I was disrespecting old school wrestling. And that kind of hurt my feelings just because like if that's old school wrestling is where I came from. I'm also smart enough to know that uh, evolution is a real thing. And like old school wrestling, even when I got into it, was it a very, very evolved business from when the predecessors before all of us started. You know what I mean? And there's always going to be that constant like battle between old heads and new guys and the people in between. You know, but there has to always be some sort of understanding that professional wrestling is art. Professional wrestling is a variety show and Absolutely. that you can have everything on a show, but sometimes you just have to be aware of your surroundings. And like, you know, for, I know that for crossbody pro wrestling anyway, you know, working hard is something that I, hard work is gold, you know, like it's invaluable because people regardless of how many people it is, there is an audience that watches our product. So if that audience watches our product, they also watch other products. So if you can go out there and you can wow them and you can make sure that you're providing that, that style of pro wrestling that I, again, I really wanted to, to get over in Kitchener and this kind of tying back to what we were talking about before, you know, one of the biggest reasons why it was super important for me that you guys had that match that you did that kind of opened the doors for people to be acceptance of that style was I wrestled a match for that other company before, uh, before we started cross body pro wrestling. And I can't, I think I, I can't, no, I can't, I can't remember exactly who I was wrestling, but I just remember I was, we were putting on like a chain wrestling clinic and all I heard from the crowd was what the fuck is this? What is <laughs> this? Boo. And I had never been so like just offended and like was so confused because I was mm. like, wait a second. Like what? Why, why is this being booed? Like, even if you're an old school wrestling fan, like you should appreciate like what wrestling is. So it was just the weirdest thing to hear, like people not appreciate that. So like, it was very, very important for me to kind of get that style over and to educate that city of that audience to understand that it's okay to, to, to like this because it's good and that you yeah. can still like that too. There's no such thing as this is better. It's not a thing. It, it, the only thing that is better is whatever you think is better in your head, you yes. know, um, especially when it comes to pro wrestling. But being open minded is just it's it's one of those things that was not so. Uh, it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. Thankfully, I think people are being a lot more open minded about the business. But there, I think you're still always going to run into that issue where people are always going to want this or want that. And, you know, you got your Jim Cornettes of the world who are going to keep their feet planted in, in, in one fight, I guess you could say, yeah. but you know, you and you, Tyler and, and Del Bruno um, put on a fucking clinic that night. 
And it was the reason why we are able to kind of do the shows that we do today. So right. I can't thank you enough for, for doing that. And I'm sure you probably get that from a lot of different companies, but um, is it, is it weird? Is it weird kind of being that guy? Cause I know that I'm not the only one that has this story. Um, it's not weird because it's exactly who I want to be. <laughs> That's a great answer. Like, I mean, no, um, e you hire a guy to have like the reason I get hired is because you want a good match on your show. Yes. And that, that, that's how most, most indie wrestlers work. Like I feel like, so I've had a weird, a weird pro wrestling career, right. Where I've been on the indies for a lot longer than people normally stay after they reach a certain level. Like I know that I've been like when I was wrestling, a lot of people whom I was wrestling with in the U S are all signed to major companies now. I'm not yes. for uh, reasons that are pretty easy to find. But um, so, yeah, like, yeah. Um, the best thing I can really do for my career is I'm going to be an indie wrestling guy for a long time, be the best indie wrestling guy possible. And like, I'm, I'm happy to hear that I've achieved that. Well, it's, it's you definitely have you know the funny thing is is that uh i almost feel like you've kind of put yourself in like this weird other level um because i i think when anybody thinks of like who who's the best like who was the best pro wrestler in canada like josh alexander was the first name that came out of everybody's mouth like for for years and it's still rightfully is. so yeah and then all of a sudden when you say that you're just like well hang on a second what about speedball and you're just like Oh yeah, you forget about speedball because you're not in Canada as often no. because you're out doing bigger and better things. Like you're in Japan a lot. You are you're yes. you're you're everywhere. And I can vouch for this because uh you know, and I've told this story to a few people, and thankfully you could probably vouch. Uh ever since that you you started with crossbody pro wrestling in that first show, I believe I have tried to literally book you for every single show since yeah. then. Yes. I have um, actually, but that is the relationship I have with a lot of promoters. Yep. Yeah. Who like whatever, like promoters all around the world that message me, are you on my continent at this date? Yep. And and, then, and I've told people that, but I don't think people actually believe me. Like, I think if we can go back and like, and check those message threads, like literally every single show I have tried to make sure that you're available for. Uh, and you know, the, the one bummer was that, uh, you were actually stupid COVID. You were actually supposed to be coming back rather soon after your last That's visit. True. You were actually yes. supposed to be coming back for our, uh, for our May night show. That's and right. uh, I was actually going to have you wrestle. I've already told you about this, but I was going to have you wrestle this kid named Jake Lander. Uh, he's from the States. He's, uh, he's from Chicago and I've had him down a couple of times and he's one of the most mind blowing performers that I've come across like in just a long time. And, and the good thing is, is like, he's still new. He thankfully with everything that's kind of going on right now, he just got his, uh, his knee scoped. So then that way he okay. can kind of get his stuff, you know, fixed. So hopefully by the time okay. wrestling comes back, you know, he'll be able to, to be able to, you know, not have to work hurt or whatever, but this kid is the future of pro wrestling. And uh, oh, yeah. I got to tell you, man, like when, when we come back, that is definitely a match that I want to put together. So look him up and, uh, and check his stuff out. Actually, there's a match with him and James Logan. I want to say his, yes, James Logan. Uh, it's on our YouTube page. It, fucking phenomenal. Like it awesome. was uh they they were the opening match on our show and uh and it's funny because i also tell this to other people as well it, they were the only other they were the second match ever that uh because yours your triple threat match being the first there was the second match ever where the crowd was making so much noise and they were like stomping their feet because they were into it so much that the monitor in my in the back of uh where i sit in my little spaceship there was like starting to shake off the desk and i was like what the fuck like this is unreal um but the funny thing is is the next question i had on the on the my my little sheet here we actually yeah. kind of already answered so so that's awesome uh that's 
the beauty of a free flowing conversation, which is nice. Um, now, one thing I do want to ask you about though, is like, what got you into to wrestling? Like, what made you, what was the spark that kind of made you start pro wrestling? Cause like you were obviously doing your Taekwondo stuff. Uh, you were, you were getting successful at it, obviously after, you know, a little bit of time where you're struggling there and you, you had that, that free time, I guess you could say. Um, but wh where was the, where was the switch? Like what happened where you were just like, I'm, I'm going after this now. So wrestling came way before Taekwondo. It did. When I was, when I was seven years old, me and my brother were flipping around the channels on the television and we saw Kane trying to set the brood on fire. And we were like, this is fantastic. So like, that was your first wrestling? First thing I saw, fell in love with it instantly. Wow, this guy's trying to set these vampires on fire. This is great. I am sold for life. I almost did a spit take there, by the way. <laughs> I was kind of hoping you would. I saw you I, take a this, spit. This microphone is brand new. <laughs> I didn't want to ruin it. I had to, I had to fight that one. Um, um, wow, great first memory. That's fucking That sweet. happened, and then immediately, like, we just took the mattresses off our beds and put them on our bedroom floor and just started suplexing each other on them. Like, Better than in, lighting each other on fire. That's um, Yeah, at least we skipped that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no you, one paid, actually... you paid attention to the do not try this shit at home thing. <laughs> Some of it. Some of it, um, yes. Right between the lines. But when I, so when I started Taekwondo later on, which was not something like I, I ever, like, I, I had wanted to. It was just kind of, I had a friend that was training at the school. And he was like, hey, do you want to come down and do a, trial class and I was like sure started it enjoyed it and in the back of my mind even as a as a 11 year old I was like huh when I start pro wrestling this will be really helpful that's funny you say that because I was just telling Justin Sane on the the last episode that just dropped Sunday which is weird because it's still Saturday at, and it is currently 2 p.m and we need to make sure that everybody is aware of this the the podcast you were watching with Speedball Mike Bailey is being dropped on Tuesday at 7 p.m., but we are filming this Saturday at 2 p.m. We say this because the world is changing on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, so we just want everybody to know where we're at while we speak about this. So, uh, what was I even saying before I went into that spiel? Holy crap, sorry. Um, starting martial arts because you want to do pro wrestling later yes, on. Yes, so I was telling Justin that uh, the, where I realized that I was going to be like good at pro wrestling once I was kind of, because I, I, I did pro wrestling, stopped for a while, did the mixed martial arts stuff and then got back into it. Uh, where, where the trigger, like where everything just clicked for me was I was uh, in my, my, my coach's training camp, Chris Clements. He was getting ready for, uh, to fight Steven Wonderboy Thompson. And oh, I, yeah. I unfortunately had to be Steven Wonderboy Thompson for his training camp. So <laughs> I, I, I think the entire training camp, I landed maybe three punches. I maybe got a leg kick in that actually landed that he didn't check. And then the only other thing that, cause like he was, we were, he had me like, we were uh, doing some sparring in the cage and like he had just taken me down. Um, and it was with that spinning wheel kick that he landed on Steven Thompson. I don't know if you've ever, okay, yeah. if you remember yes. that, but like yes. a sent mass over tea I, kettle. I remember that. I was the fucking tackling dummy that he practiced that move on. And it fucking sucked because he hit it every single time and I couldn't do anything about it. There was times when I would literally think that I was like, Oh my God, I got this. And then I, I wouldn't know what happened. I would literally be fucking feet over my head and I'd be like, I got nothing. So anyway, he's, he's got me down and he's kind of just got me in like a, like a grappling position and he's just laying in like, you know, punches, but light punches, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. And my pro wrestling technique just kind of like clicked in and I shot a, basically like a reversal on a waist lock, grabbed his leg and fucking shot my hips through and it worked. And next thing I know, I'm on top of him and I'm like, start raining down light, very light. Cause I didn't want that receipt, uh, very light punches on him. And then it, as I'm doing that, I was just like, holy shit, my footwork and everything would be so much better for pro wrestling now. Yes. So I completely get where you're, uh. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's so true. Um, so, but that's really common. I was listening to an, a Tito Ortiz interview on a podcast recently where he talked about when he signed up for wrestling in high school, he thought it was going to be a like 
because he saw it on TV and he thought it was going to be pro wrestling. And then he was like, where's the ring? And then he started and then, but I th- like, I think that's very, co- fairly common for yeah. wrestling and pro wrestling to like, for martial artists to see pro wrestling on TV and be like, oh, this is great. And the other way as well, but. hundred um, percent. No, it's, it's so useful and it's so important. And like, I think one of the, like a lot of Taekwondo sparring is just kind of like drills and sequences, right? So, like, for example, um, you will give me these two kicks and I'll counter with that one and then you'll finish with that one. And that's mm-hmm. just a normal drill. There's so much of that in pro wrestling. And just, like, memory and timing, which is super important. And I'm super glad I started working on that when I was 11. Yeah. Um, as For the black belt test in Taekwondo, there's a thing called Olympic Techniques, mm-hmm. which is just, like, six little pre-planned sparring exchanges which is basically a pro wrestling match, but out of Taekwondo. That's, That's that, like I got to do a, a, like a bunch of times before I even started like yeah. actual professional wrestling. So in a weird way, like Taekwondo just set you up perfectly for pro Perfect. wrestling. Yeah, but there's a lot. Yeah. I mean, That's awesome. Yes. Sorry. Uh, well, I, what I was going to ask was like, so did, did you run into like, did you run into any, I ask this question to everybody, but I kind of have to ask it a little bit differently here. So like yes. you know, what I what normally ask is like, you know, when you first start pro wrestling, you, you kind of realize that, you know, it's a lot harder than you thought it was going to be just because uh, you watch it on TV and you, you think it's something, but you realize once you start doing it, that it's, it's a lot different. Like the ropes feel different. The, the ring feels different. Everything is just different. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's also nothing like you thought it was going to be, but in your circumstance and in your situation, it was almost in a weird way, like kind of identical. So how, what was like your biggest obstacle, I guess, making that transition, uh, being able to kind of do both? So, uh, this is a very retrospective thing. And it's like, I had this thought very clearly as I was watching a match of mine from, I think like 2008, when I was really into wrestling, uh, sorry, when I was really early into wrestling, uh, me and my brother started backyard wrestling when I was, when I was seven and he was nine mm-hmm. and we just wrestled, we'd wrestle, we spent hours wrestling every day and just giving moves to each other until, um, I don't know, I probably stopped doing that when I was 16 or whatever. Um, when I was, when I was 14 and too young to attend a wrestling school, my brother was attending pro wrestling school. And then he would just show me what he learned on our Taekwondo mats after class. So whatever happened to your brother's pro wrestling dream? Uh, he wrestled for a while. He was, he was very good. Um, and then his brother ended up being speedball Mike Bailey and just fucked up his whole life. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. No, he works as a teacher now in high school and he's doing great. Um, right. still very, still very, he did Taekwondo as well and he's still very active with the school and he, uh, I've been doing mock shows at IWS, which is kind of like, just like a full on show, but no crowd, just for people to get to practice. And he did a match just for, for fun. Um, so he, like, he awesome. can still go, he can still walk. He was very good. It's just that like, there comes a point in pro wrestling where you're either gonna start making money at it and then it's going to take off or you're not going to be starting to make money at it because of circumstances or whatever. And then other things are just going to take over where when I was kind of in that moment, my career got to take off. And then when he was in that moment, his, like he started really getting into his education and he just went to university and became a teacher. And And that's fair. I mean, you gotta, you know, once you reach a certain age, you gotta start to realize like, where is your path really truly heading? And if, you know, if if you're, Um, Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll finish uh, yeah, yeah, where I do. was going with the. To answer your question about what what was difficult about <clears throat> pro wrestling, when I was looking about the, at that match, I like there was me and there was my whole group of like my circle, the people I wrestled with that were my friends, and like we all, we we're all young and athletic, and we could do cool stuff, and we cared, and it's not like we were poorly trained. We knew the basics of wrestling very well. Mm-hmm. but no one had taught us how to have a good match. I get that. 
which, <laughs> which is the part I was talking about that I'm trying very hard to teach people because it's the most important. Back in 2008 in Quebec, where you were still kind of looked down upon for planning your matches, yeah. there was no one to tell me like, Things that are very simple and you know if you're a pro wrestler is trying to be decent, like, hey, maybe the heat, which is the part where the bad guy is in control, which usually happens, shouldn't be three quarters of your match. Yes. And it's, it's funny. <laughs> well, you it's end funny up you like mentioned, your friend. Yes. And uh, <laughs> the funny thing is, the funny you mentioned that just because um, that essentially – exact story is how me and uh the notorious tid found tyler loveman tyler thomas uh for yeah. everybody watching uh we he was just like this kid on a show that tid was was working on and he he told me about him like i, I went to his place there the like i think he did a show with them the one weekend and then we had a, another show that the, all three of us were going to be on the following weekend but i was at uh tid's house like at some point in time in the, in the middle of that midweek, he starts telling me about this kid. And he's just like, we gotta, we gotta do, we gotta help him. And this was before we even had a, a school. He's like, we have to, we have to take this kid under our wing. And I'm like, who is he? And he's just like, tells me who he is. And then I go and I watch uh, him wrestle on the show that we, that we did on the weekend. And I was just like, Oh my God, this kid's like special, but he just doesn't, he doesn't have a clue. So yeah. I, pulled them aside and I kind of started to chat with them. And then it dawned on me. I was just like, like, I, like I was asking them a lot of like, you know, a lot of questions. And then I came away realizing that as far as his training went, that he had had previous to him training under myself and Tid was that he was basically, it was like, here, here's a hundred moves. Yes. Go figure it out. Yes. And, uh, not a knock on the, the the school that he was at. It was just that yeah. that was the situation that he found himself in. It was just like, here's... But that, here's but that, that is entirely the model for teaching pro wrestling 90% of the time. It's, yeah. here, here's, how, here's some bumps, here's some holds, here's some moves, now go participate on a wrestling show. Yeah, and you're kind of just dropped off in like this really weird deep end, and that's that's not how you learn. Like, that's that's how you survive, but that's not how you learn, you know? And the like the idea behind like my success as an independent wrestler is to, and to always, always be able to have a good match is to break down, is to figure out why things work, break yes. them down, yes. understand why they work, because that's how you'll be able to replicate it and then well, make sure that. That is how, See, and that's the unfortunate part because when you hear people say to young guys, uh, what's, what's one of the most pieces of, uh, important pieces of advice you can give? Go study film. Okay, what the fuck does that mean? Study hmm. film. Do you want me just to watch it and be like, good match? Most people don't understand the concept of studying film. Like they don't, they've maybe never played, you know, like football or they've never played a sport that actually allows you to, or mixed martial arts, for example, or boxing or whatever that makes you literally sit down and break down techniques and as to why they worked and to just so, the, all these different things. Sorry, go ahead. You know, MMA, so it's going to be very easy for you to understand. Yes. The one piece of advice that makes my blood boil every time I hear someone say it is, Go watch some old world of sports wrestling to study tape. Go watch some old uh, WCW from the 90s. Like, there is no one that you're telling this to that is going to wrestle for WCW in the 90s. No one you're telling this to is 6'7 and a mountain of steroids. <laughs> imagine, you, imagine telling people for MMA, go study tape and you tell them, go watch Royce Gracie on UFC one. Yeah. You can't. It's the same thing. It doesn't make any sense. It's not what you're doing. It's not the same sport. It's the same thing for pro wrestling. Where do you want to wrestle? You want to wrestle for NXT? Then go watch some NXT matches and understand how it works. However, you're an indie wrestler for now. So go watch some of the best indie matches and then try to break them down and understand why they work. I hundred percent agree with that. Um, so, with all the like that being said, like I mean, you know, you you you, f you were able to figure it out rather quickly, it, it seems. So like, but what was like your first no. real? Sorry, no, sorry, you weren't. But absolutely not. No, it took me 
years, li- like literally years to figure it out. Okay. Way so then, longer than I wish it would have been. Perfect. Cause that's my next question. What was your first like aha moment that made you figure this out that you were just like, I got it. Everything clicks. I, I'm good at this now. Like where, what was, what was the first thing that made you like get it, you know? So the, there were little, little moments and things that, that helped and made sense. But like, I, I, like there's moments very early on when I had, so I, me and my brother wrestled each other all the time. And we had a match one time that we, we just, we made it. It was like a year into our careers. We made it and it was really good. Mm-hmm. And promoter loved it. Um, and then a month later we had a match. Like we had just, we went to a show and it was like, hey, you guys, you guys got to go up first in 10 minutes. And we're like, oh, what do we do? And we're like, remember that match we did a month ago? Yeah, let's do that. Oh, okay. And then it went great again because it went great the last time. And then we just got to do it again. Like, and that was very early on. And it was a moment where I was like, oh, great. If I just go to this match, then it's always great. And just understanding like that part. But there was like also so many moments where I was like, fuck, I should have this. And I don't like, I remember wrestling. So uh, wrestling Kenny Omega at PWG. And then like, just the way his mind worked and the level at which he was planning things and understood and broke it down and knew where to do what and why was like, fuck, I, I should that. be better at this. I really, really, like, I really, really felt way behind. Like, of course, Kenny Omega is pro wrestling genius, easily one of the best in the world. I'm sure most people have that same, like, frame of mind when they wrestle him. Like, I've, I've had experiences like that before. But then later on, when I finally got to DDT, Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of things I, which is the promotion I work for in Japan for the last uh, over three years, but, and understood how things were, how things happened there that I really understood, okay, this is the way to do pro wrestling and mm-hmm. this is how you do it. And this is how it should work. And this is how it makes the most sense. And from like from my debut in Japan and then on, and the more I was able to adapt to DT, DDT style, the more I understood how pro wrestling should be. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that you say that because uh, it's, and it's funny that it's the same guy that made you see wrestling differently. Kenny Omega was uh, re- wrestling. Kenny Omega was what changed my vision of what pro wrestling was. I was yes. st- like, I, I wrestled Kenny when he was very young. Like he was super, it was, so was I, mind you. Um, but I went on that tour where I wrestled him uh, to wrestle somebody different, a guy named Chichi Cruz, which was like, he ended up becoming like one of my mentors in wrestling, but you know, old school guy. I was raised an old school guy. So I wanted to go and wrestle the best fucking old school guy that there was. And I did get a chance to wrestle him on that tour. Um, very scary, like 45 minute matches, hour long matches where we, he literally only told me what the finish was. Uh, not, and not even the sequence, just the move. And we would just go out and he, he would figure it out for me. And it was great. But the rest of the tour, I was wrestling Kenny Omega and, uh, we were doing a singles match to start the show. And then we would do a tag match, uh, at the end of the night to finish off the, the show. And the, your, the way that his mind operated and the way that he went about wrestling made me realize, oh, we're ch- this, this sport's changing. Like yes. this, this, <laughs> the, the thought of this is complex and I only understand the surface. Yeah. And I'm like, as he's explaining to this, uh, to like, I'm, I'm almost getting mad at him. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you doing all this stuff? And then we would do the match. And like a lot of the stuff he, we would like argue about. And then he would just be like, I'm not going to do it. Fine. Fuck you win. And the next thing I know we would get out there and he would just fuck and he would go and he didn't give a fuck. He was getting his, he was getting his stuff. And then we argued quite a bit during that tour. And then eventually at the end of it, we were just like, it kind of earned each other's respect. Um, because I was just like, you know what, dude, I, and wrestling, I'm operating at a different level now. Like I, yes. and I didn't even realize it because I have had to keep up with, with your scrawny ass. Cause he was a scrawny dude back then. And, uh, he, when I went back to Ontario after that tour, I was a different dude. And like the way that I viewed wrestling was completely different. I, I, it was like, um, 
I, it, it, it's almost just like you, you believe in magic and then all of a sudden you just walk behind a corner and you see how the magician's doing the trick in, in a weird way. Like it was the weirdest thing, but uh, amazing that we both have the same story though. So, but yeah, my, like I want to do that for, when I do seminars and stuff, that is what I want to do for people. I want to demonstrate how complex it is, but how like, it's attainable and it's a choice you have to make. Mm -hmm. No, I, I get that. So, um, yeah. one thing I wanted to talk to you about is just because like you're, 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 you're in Japan a lot, you know, yeah. um, you, you already spoke about DDT. Uh, and for anybody who hasn't watched DDT, um, it's very different. You know, if you had to, Japanese wrestling in general is just different. If you've never really, you know, watched Japanese wrestling and if you're just kind of like into whatever North America provides you, you know, on whatever plate. But like if you had to explain like the Japanese wrestling scene to somebody who's, you know, North American, uh, they're a wrestling fan who's not maybe familiar with the scene that's down there. What would be like, what would be the best way for you to explain it to them? And like, what would you recommend people go out of their way to watch and check out as a uh, good representation of what that style truly is? That is a very, very difficult and broad question. Um, there's a, a lot of, guy. yeah. Um, use Japanese food as an example. Okay. Uh, there's like types of types of Japanese restaurants. There's like six main ones or something: a ramen shop, a sushi shop, tempura, uh, yakiniku, which is like Korean barbecue, and uh, like a couple more that I'm not gonna think of. Regardless, sure. Okay. Um, so ramen is one of my favorite food. Like just a bowl of noodle soup mm -hmm. uh, is one of my favorite foods. <clears throat> in the world by far it's super popular in japan there's like it of course it's super popular in japan and there's a lot of ramen shops and there's very very clear rules to what ramen is there's an infinity of variations upon that team and there's regions and there's like ways to do it and there's style and there's shops that follow the things but it's a very clear tradition of what ramen is and when you make a bowl of ramen when you open a ramen shop your thought is usually i want to do this style but better and you have centuries of it like of people understanding it and then adding to it which is pretty much what is happening to what happens to pro wrestling in japan right the main difference between japanese pro wrestling and uh, pro wrestling in most other countries is that there's a lot less independent wrestlers. When you work for one promotion, you're going to work for one promotion with the same people and you're not going to take many outside bookings. Of course, there's some independent wrestlers, but a lot of people work with within the company. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, if you take like DDT Noah, Dragon Gate and all those, they all have a very specific style because it's always the same 30 people with a slightly rotating cast that will wrestle each other so it very much becomes a style for a promotion mm -hmm. um one of the most uh like one of the things that i found the most fascinating when i got to japan and when i talk about care is something i think we could be we could all be a lot better at which is when you go to ddt and you have your first match everyone's going to be watching and then the next day, the person that you have to wrestle will already know everything you do. And they will have ideas and counters and ways to go in and out of everything you just did the night before because they're watching and they know you're in DDT, you're going to be in DDT for a while, they're going to have to wrestle, you're better off figuring out exactly what to do right. uh, within that. Okay, that I think, makes a lot of like, sense. It makes a ton of sense. When I talk about also care and being lazy, like um, this is a complete tangent regardless. Everyone has YouTube. Everyone has matches on YouTube. You have very, very little excuse to wrestle someone and not walk through the door of the venue and have already 
an idea of what the well know the other person's move and what he does and ideally they're come back and their finishes and have ideas how to go in and out of all of it you have absolutely no excuse for that especially if you had a long car ride in which you could have just opened your phone and looked at it like that's available to everyone it's just laziness if you don't do that which is the bare minimum and it is completely normal practice in japan um like there's traditions before someone starts messing messing with the style and trying new things they must understand everything that is there for them mm -hmm. and i think that makes for a very very good uh system yeah yeah system. so uh, uh, is there is there a specific match that maybe you feel like would be a good represent like ddt for example you know yes very different um but awesome to watch what would be yes. what do you think is a good representation for someone to go and be like hey i want to check out some ddt and i want to i want to get into this and i want to see if it's something that i'm into like what would you tell them to go watch Oh man, I'd have to look through the YouTube channel to be able to get a good response. I don't even know what's on there. See, uh, they have a DDT Universe, which is their streaming service, which of course I'm on and I watch as many shows as I can. But um, trying to think really hard what's on the channel. Um, go watch a match with uh, Konosuke Takeshita, who is in DDT. He's currently not the champion, but he very often is. He is, in my opinion, one of the best wrestlers in the world. He has main evented DDT's like big yearly show many, many times. Um, what's so amazing about someone like Takeshita is to see him do um, have a, a killer, world class, best match in the world, 45 minute title match main event in front of 3,000 people, and do that and do a version of that that no one else can replicate where it's like his style is relatively simple it's pretty old school but it's perfect right see him nail that and then recently uh ddd had their yearly peter pan show and he, he had a um uh what do they call it what do you call the boneyard match what is that a cinematic match Right, a cinematic match with uh, <laughs> Yoshiko, which is the blow-up doll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had essentially a, a boneyard match with the blow-up doll. <laughs> and it is fantastic. It is hilarious. It is about 45 minutes. 45 and he does that minutes. amazingly. Um, oh, man. And that's, but that's why... Yes. That's why I think DDT is so good and does... Uh, does does so well because there's a fantastic contrast between great wrestling and outlandish comedy, and it's just yeah. it's not just one or the other; it's always both. And especially the longer shows, the shows that are six, seven hours, there's always a like there there's never any repetition in terms of what the matches are. It always just goes and changes and builds and gets more and more fun without you getting bored of any of it, which is fantastic. Well, that's awesome, man. Uh, yeah. I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put that gentleman's name in the, uh, in the description. So then hopefully people can go and check out some of his stuff. Now, yes. one thing I do want to start getting into is cause I just want to change the pace up a little bit here is I'm really curious about everybody's training habits and what they're doing, especially right now yes. during, you know, the, you know, the quarantine and all this shit. So like, you know, one thing I want to ask is, you know, what are you doing for, for training right now? Like what, how are you working out? Like, is there, do you got a program that you're doing right now? Or are you kind of just winging it? Uh, yes. So I'm lucky enough to have, uh, someone in my ha household, which is my brother with whom I can train. So we've been doing, uh, we've been alternating Taekwondo and boxing and we've been doing like one day, one, the other day, the other. So that's mm -hmm. probably an hour of practicing a skill or an hour of martial arts approximately every day and then on top of that i've split out i split down my my uh workouts into just uh <laughs> let's say two and a half days sure um, push pull and one day i go and i do backflips backflips so cool really, well trick gymnastics tricking flipping whatever you want to call it but sure. one day is gymnastics then push pull and then uh, push and pull. I just do 20 sets of whatever exercise I can do. E exercises, sorry, 20 sets in total. So like, mm -hmm. let's say it's five exercises. It'll be four sets of each. 
and I write down my sets on a sheet of paper and cross them out anytime because when you're not in the gym, there is no pressure and that takes away from motivation. So and it, there's days it, where I've been like done after 18 sets and I must do those 20 religiously because it's on a sheet. And if I have an incomplete day, it'll be there forever. That's accountability right there. Right. So what are you doing to fuel your system right now? Just cause I'm sure that like, again, it's a little bit different. Like you're not on the road as much. You actually have the ability to cook your own food. Um, you have the ability to basically eat whatever you want. You're not stuck eating garbage gas station food or whatever you have to find on yes. the road to, to do, you know, basically to get by. So like, how, how are you fueling your body these days? Um, I enjoy cooking. I really, really like cooking. I I've been to cooking school for a year and really, like, I like it. Yeah. So I've been kind of not super strict in terms of what I eat. Like okay. I'm not trying to gain or lose weight. I'm trying to maintain and eat things I enjoy with kind of the right nutrition profile. Kind of in the same boat right now, just because like I don't need to look a certain way for anything, but I'd also like to be a week or two away if I need to be able to be a week or two away, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> right. But I think like I don't think if you, you don't have access to a good gym, right now is not the time to be uh, leaning down because you'll lose a lot of strength when you do start and especially it's, it's also not the time to really try to gain a lot of weight so i think right now like maintenance is the most prudent way to go 100 percent um and if i'm just going to maintain i might as well if i'm just going to maintain and have a lot of free times then i might as well just make myself food that i enjoy well what kind of food do you enjoy what are you eating uh let's see what did i make that was fun um I made myself a killer couscous the other day. Couscous. Very yes. nice. Uh, lamb. It's fun to uh, say too. It is fun to say. Yeah. I, what was I eating? I made myself a nice, uh, very meaty tomato sauce uh -huh. that I've been putting on top of polenta. And I ate that with some just lightly sauteed kale with some Parmesan cheese on it. Did you say, uh, you said lamb, correct? The, for the couscous, yes. Okay. Were you not, uh, were you on a vegetarian kick at one point? I'm, I feel like I, you were on a vegetarian kick. Am I wrong? Um, sometimes uh, Veda, my girlfriend, is vegetarian. And so when that's I'm with her, I'll often just eat vegetarian food. Because... Okay. So that's where I got mixed up. Because I think that you did eat vegetarian the weekend that you guys were down here for some reason. Probably. Who knows? But uh Okay. So that's good to know. So like what types of protein do you normally like put into your system then? Like, um, meat and eggs. <laughs> okay. No, that's, that's yeah. good. Just, uh, uh the reason why I ask, yeah. sorry, the reason why I ask is just because I know that everybody's body is just so different, you know? And like, um, the reason why I want to chat with this about everybody is just because like, I want people to know like what it is that you do fuel your system with so then that way of like if somebody wanted to try to be you know i want to be mike bailey or i want to try to be mike mike bailey you know i want to i want to have uh i want to be able to fuel myself to be able to you know have fast twitch muscle fiber or be you know have endurance or whatever whatever it is you know so hopefully you don't think i'm just asking like these dumb questions it's actually just for it's for people who genuinely want to know and see if they can maybe you know switch their own shit up you know um no that definitely makes a lot of sense um like I've definitely been on all the diets and had my weight go up and down, especially because I was cutting weight at one point for Taekwondo competitions, which sure, you know, you, you starve yourself and then you binge and then you get that cycle going, which is completely unhealthy. Yeah. And then it's... of course you try all the quick diets with that, but I like, you have to find what works for you. It has to be sustainable. You have to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. There's a I I love the the self punishment bodybuilder diet with the steamed broccoli and chicken no seasoning whatsoever yeah. like this is I think stuff like that is only good if you're getting ready for a competition like a bodybuilding competition mm -hmm. and if you're not then there's no reason just eat things that you enjoy but less of it um like I think that's one of the mistakes people make is that they think like the more I think the more uh, emotional pain they cause themselves the better results they'll get and I think that's wrong 
that that goes for all training by the way you're right uh, even like d- diet and all training in martial arts like if you're if you hate your martial arts training chances are it's not going to make you better quite the opposite you're better off doing things you enjoy mm-hmm. no that makes sense so what we're going to do there my friend is we're going to move into the old rapid fire portion of the uh the podcast the, it's everybody's oh, yeah. favorite it's everybody's favorite part where you have to think on your feet and you realize that as soon as you're finished you're like fuck i gave the wrong answer i should have said this whatever but just a little fun little exercise all right so i'm gonna fire 10 questions at you and again you don't have to explain yourself just give me the first thing that pops into your head all right okay so what's your favorite match that you've been a part of Oof. Uh, so. I'm hesitating very hard between two, so I'll just give both. Uh, me versus Mao, which is my tag team partner in Japan, uh, a singles match against each other at Korakuen Hall, uh, I think two years ago, maybe. Okay. Um, because we decided we would start kind of figuring out what this match was going to be three days before. And this is when I lived... Uh, in the DDT dojo. So I had access to the ring 24 seven. So we, we oh, really great. got to make that match what we wanted it to be. Um, and then there was myself and Veda Scott at uh, Riptide versus Club Tropicana, mm-hmm. which we just made the choice. So they kind of have a comedy gimmick. And then we decided we would do all the crazy stunts and all the big outlandish comedy spots. <laughs> wrapped up in one like ridiculous 15 minute package the reason i've been like i I like that match so much is because it's been described uh, like if your friends don't know pro wrestling show them this match because it has every all the good elements of it anywhere that we can find that like is that on youtube or or Uh, independent wrestling independent wrestling i think uh riptide i don't remember the name of the show Okay. Well, I'll but try to was, find it, it and was, I'll try to throw it in the description because that's definitely something August, I want to go check yeah. out from last yeah. August. Okay. Worth I'll it, go yeah. and have a look. Um, who's not on TV right now? Who should be on TV right now other than yourself? Um, Japan doesn't count. Mm, yeah, let's just, you know what? Let's stick with North America just so then that way uh, our audience will know who you're talking about. Um, God, that's a TDT. Good answer. Um, they are. I mean, they're on TV with IWS and sometimes, but they like they are the best. Like mm-hmm. it's absolutely world class, and they deserve to be on everyone's TV. And it's really a tragedy that they're not. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, they're they're pretty easy answer that way. Who's your favorite band? Woof. Uh, it goes back and forth a lot. Band artist, band Modest Mouse. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there is an answer for this for you, but who's your favorite sports team? Oof. No, no answer. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> think that you were, I, I didn't see you being a big sports guy. Um, no. You know, let me change the question. Who's your favorite fighter? Uh, naturally, GSP. Kind of figured. Uh, who's your favorite person that you've worked with thus far? Like, who's your favorite opponent? Ooh, so that's a very hard one. Um, Remember, it's not solid. You could you could give two or three if you'd like. Yeah. Um, so that's difficult because there's a lot of categories, and like I, Will Osprey is, I think, right now probably the best wrestler in the world. And so, in terms of an opponent, he's, he's amazing. But there's. Like, there's also people that I just have a lot of fun with. So I guess I'll stick to Will Ospreay. Okay. Um, What's the biggest goal that you have set for yourself that you've accomplished? Uh, So that debut in Japan was very, very validating. Mm -hmm. Like, that felt like not one of those, I I can retire now because I don't want to, but one of those, like, this is very, very concrete and very clear that wrestling has been, like, I have some force, some sort of, some sort of uh, success in pro wrestling because I have done this. I get that. So what's the next goal that uh, that's on your list that you would like to accomplish? There's a lot. Um, I think the longest term goal is to be able to 
have people on my or my company's payroll. Okay. I want, pe- I want people, not just me, but along- alongside me or because of me to make a living off of pro wrestling. I like that answer a lot. Um, who are, I say five, but I mean, you can come up with whatever number you want. What up, what up and coming names uh, that come to your head do people need to watch out for? Like young guys. Let's see. That's a very, very hard question because as a person who travels around a lot, you see a lot of them. I see a lot. I have a, uh, I have a lot of Canadian. I'm going to try to stick with Canadian names. How yeah, about sure. that? Let's um, do that. Carl Jepson. Okay. Which is a Quebec wrestler. Kevin Beru. Other guy in Quebec. Uh, Matthew Busado, who is a IWS dojo student, who, who I've been working very closely with for the past, for like a, f- a few months when I was teaching regularly at the IWS dojo. He was there every class. And mm-hmm. He was good, but he got like a lot better in that time. Um, I need two more, don't I? If you would like. Um, yes. Yes. Um, Use the time to put people over, you know? Yeah. Uh, trying really hard to think. This is hard. This is really hard. Five is a hard, uh, hard number for this. I'll you know give what? up with three. I'm tapping out. We could stick with three. That's that's not a problem, yeah. you know. Um, what's your proudest moment thus far? That's outside of the ring. What's your favorite? What's your uh, most proudest personal moment? Hmm. Uh, I want to say getting my taekwondo black belt. That's a good answer. And what is the best piece of advice that you can give to somebody who wants to do what you do? deep huh focus on your strengths so figure instead of trying to be good at everything figure out what you're good at and double down on that and stick with that forever and never stop practicing it and always remember that it's one of your strengths even if you get good at other things keep the focus on what you're good at that's very good advice um now to finish the show or to, to start to wrap the show up anyway, you know, one of the things that I like to do with my guests, cause uh, again, it's, it's the whole point is to kind of get to know each other a little bit better just because we don't always get to catch up, you know, busy guys. Um, is there any questions that you have for me or is there anything about me that you'd like to know? Um, so I know you asked me this before and I know I had some good questions. Um, what is the hardest thing you've ever had to do? So I know you've done you've done loads of pro wrestling, yeah. You've had MMA fights. Mm-hmm. You've been a sparring partner, oh, kickbox, for a, kickboxing a fights. Yeah, not MMA kickboxing fights. fights. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, you, you've been a sparring partner. Usually, I know that most people who train in mixed martial arts, or it was definitely the case for me in Taekwondo, where the training is always much harder than the actual fights. Mm-hmm. But yep. and also in just in life, I know you you opened a school and you've like had to run and set up shows. And for a lot of people, that's more stressful and coaching. So I want to know what, what is the hardest for you? Um, as, as far as the actual activities go, uh, it's, it's kind of a different, like it's a weird, weird answer that I have. Like, I think that pro wrestling is probably the hardest thing that I've done. Uh, mixed martial arts is one of the hardest things that I've done, but for a completely different reason, because, you know, in mixed martial arts, you have that ability uh, or kickboxing, whatever it is that you're doing, you have that ability to train and get good enough to the point where like, if you're sparring with somebody, if you, if you have the skill and you don't want to get hurt, you can do that. You know, Uh, it doesn't matter what you do in pro wrestling. If you're, if you're having a practice match, if you're training, uh, if you're having a real match, whatever you do, uh, you have to give your body up. You're taking bumps regardless. You're getting hit regardless. Uh, so that that takes a, a different toll on the body than mixed martial arts or or boxing or or anything does. You know, it's a completely it's a completely different style, mm-hmm. um, and it's a completely different thing. If if I'm being completely honest with what's the hardest thing I've ever done, is yeah. managing to get through all of this with uh, without believing like like there's a there's a 
so I've been on my own since I was 16. Right. And like, right. I've, I've never, I've never been confident in myself. Like I've had a lot of uh, like depression issues. Like I've had a lot yeah. of uh, self doubt. Like I, I've never, I, I, I've like, I'm like the epitome of a train wreck, I guess. Like when it comes to, to being a human being, mm-hmm. being able to get through all of that. And like, I mean, it's, it's a, still a struggle every day, mind you, yes. but being able to kind of get through a lot of those mental barriers. I've been on my own since I was 16. I've slept outside my, uh, the, the first ever wrestling gym that I trained at, which was also a boxing gym, which was the Regency boxing club in Hamilton. Like I've, I've, I've slept on the street in one of the most like ghetto ass corners of, of Hamilton, which isn't the cleanest city to begin with, you know? Um, I've got a lot of different weird life experiences where there was a, a time frame where once I had started to train wrestling and kind of once I was on my own to however many years it was down the road, I had literally stopped counting at a hundred uh, of the different places that I had stayed or slept, lived, you name it, you know, life was very, very hard. And I mean, and I was also, you know, I was always the fat kid growing up too. You know, I was never, I never, I was always, also always very awkward. Uh, you know, I was never, popular with the ladies. I was never popular with people, you know, growing up was very difficult for me. And that's, if I'm being completely honest with you, that's one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to start this project was because I feel like I'm at a good point in my life now where like, I feel like I'm getting better at communicating. I feel like I can finally like speak to people like human beings. And especially in a time where like right now, where we have the time to do this, um, I felt the need to jump on it because it was helping me creatively, but literally the hardest thing uh, to kind of tie this all back together was to be able to get to where I'm at right now, which, you know, I'm still just a guy living my life, but I'm also a business owner now. And I own, you know, I co-own a gym. I, uh, I own uh, and operate two different wrestling companies, you know, essentially I, um, there's just a lot on my, there's a lot on my plate and like, I've been able to do things that, uh, I, ne- I was always told that would never happen for me. I was always told that the WWE or WWF was never a possibility for me because I was mm-hmm. either the shits, I was too fat, or because if I'm being completely honest with you, people fucking hated me for outing was a pedophile. Sorry. It is what it is. I did it before this whole shit was cool. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but like when I did that back in the day, um, there was not a lot of people that were on board with that. And a lot of people that were friends with that guy made my life a living hell and they continued to for a long time. So my ability to advance forward in the business was almost like I had a roof on me. So dealing with all of that uh, by myself as a completely insecure human being and be able to get through all of this and being able to have people in my life, like the notorious TID and, um, and just other, other people around me. But I mentioned him specifically because like, he kind of taught me how to really be a man and to just kind of be able to get through all of this. And because of him, you know, I'm, I'm now competent enough to be a business owner, be a, a guy that does all of these different things and be able to actually handle it emotionally without like completely breaking down and, and crying and like, uh, and losing myself. So I know that's a bit of a long winded answer, but no, I mean, if I'm perfect. being completely so, honest with you, that was definitely the hardest thing. That makes, that makes a whole lot of sense. And I think, um, when I say, when I speak about focusing on your, on your strength, which is something I'm, I'm very like, I think is very important, which like, it kind of sounds like the story you're describing, which is like, I mean that in terms of like concretely for pro wrestling, if you're good at suplexes, do a lot of suplexes, but also for life, if you don't have the best social skills or you're not that good in school, but you are great at, you do Taekwondo and you very much enjoy it, then you can always rely on that and, focus on that and get good at that. And if you have this one thing you're passionate and get good at that, then everything kind of trickles down from there. Yeah, man. Like it's, it's, it's weird to, to say this and I, and I don't expect a lot of people to understand this, but you know, for, for a long time, like I always thought that I was like this really, I was weird and that I didn't like relate to people because like you see yeah. these, you see everybody else growing up and it's like, they've got these perfect, like 
they've yes. got their par- their parents are married like they've got a fucking yes. like house and like they do these family get togethers and all this stuff and like that just i mean i'm not saying that i didn't have those things but like by the time i was 14 15 like family was a non-existent thing for me like i i was on my own you know and like i'm not trying to speak ill of my family but that's just that's the honest to god's truth and like so i'm i'm growing up with all of these things where like i don't have i i didn't get to finish high school you know like my for example, like when my brother turned 16, like my parents bought him a car. When I turned 16, I'm literally trying to figure out how the fuck I'm going to eat my next meal. Different path and a different like yeah. way of life, you know? So, um, th- again, like it's, it's one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to do this is because like I know that eventually this was stuff that I wanted to talk about. And like I wanted people to know like – um, cause I, in a weird way, I also know that people view me uh, a little bit differently now. And like, I'm, I'm in a bit of an influential spot just because I'm a promoter and I, you know, I've, uh, whatever the, the hell else that, you know, you do it's so I, I'm trying to, uh, try, trying to do all this, having that kind of uh, background, you know what I mean? To be that guy and to get to where I'm at right now is, is probably the proudest thing that I've ever done because right. I once once I realized that everybody was just against me and that I, I the only person that could stop me from doing the things that I ever wanted to do were me, I did those things. I I got to I did extra work for the WWE, you know? Like I did uh I, I got to fucking produce live pay per views for, for impact and, and do, you know, and produce weeks of, of television and and do these things that I was never supposed to fucking do. I was never supposed to be that guy there. But then I worked my ass off and and realized that it, as corny as this sounds, pro wrestling is literally the only thing in my life that has never left me. It's the only thing that has stayed consistent in my life. It's the only thing that like at one point in time, I thought it was the reason why I was hurt. And then it dawned on me that pro wrestling isn't the reason for anybody's mistakes. You, people who blame pro wrestling are, are literally providing reasons to blame something else for them being shitty people. And I've, yes. once I realized that and I realized, oh, man, you're just a shitty guy right now making really stupid, shitty decisions. And you got to own up to that. And, and if you don't, then you're never going to progress. And uh and I did. And I got, I get to be able to sit down with my nephew. You know, I don't have any kids, but I get to sit down and I get to tell my nephew that like, don't fucking listen to a goddamn word. Anybody tells you, which is like, if you want to do whatever the <laughs> fuck you want to do, you can go do it. All those people that tell you don't like, fuck, I'm ah, getting emotional, but like, oh, hell yeah. but like it's good pod, you're the only person that can stop you from doing whatever you want to do. Yes. You know, and that's, Absolutely. that's what people need to know because, uh, no matter how hard it is or no matter how hard things seem, if you're, if you, if you wake up and you got a fucking breath in your body, you can do whatever the fuck you want and it might be harder, but life's hard, you know, and you got to get through it. <laughs> you made me goddamn cry on my own podcast, Mike. Oh no. <laughs> whatever. That's all good. That's a good story. Um, yeah, no, that that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's important, you know? And like I said, uh, it's the most important, you, you know, I, I, exactly. Like my, the biggest thing for me with, uh, with wrestling is like, you know, ha, per, you, you can put anybody that you want around you. And as weird as that sounds, it's a lesson I learned from, uh, from working an alpha one show. I heard, I heard Ethan page say it the one time. And I remember it pissed me off when he said it. But then once I started running my own shows, I was like, fuck, I get it. He said, you know, the one thing I love about being a promoter is that you don't have to pick the most talented guys to work for your show. You could pick whoever you want to be on your show because I don't want to surround myself with assholes. I could pick, I I could just put people around me that I enjoy having and we can go have fun together as friends. I didn't understand that at the time. And then it dawned on me, like, again, once I started running shows, I was like, I get what he means. Everybody's good now to a certain extent. Yes. So if you put good people around you, then, and everybody's like-minded, you know, and you get to just walk out, not just better wrestlers and better at the thing that you love to do, but you get to walk out of there a better person as well. What can tell me, tell me something that could be better. That that's honestly the dream. And 
when I saw, so when I saw your, your setup for the first time, we're just going back to the beginning now. That's kind of why I'm so like, I, I thought it was, it looked so appealing because it's your, your school with your gym and you decide who you want to be around and you only have to be around like-minded people and people that you trust and, yeah. you know, care for. And that's, that's what you couldn't ask for anything better than that. hundred percent, man. And you know what? Uh, with all that being said, uh, I'm going to just start wrapping things up here, my man. Uh, I'm going to just go over some plugs here real quick before we completely wrap it up. Uh, guys, you can find the show, the Big Ben and Friends podcast show on Twitter and Instagram at Big Ben AF podcast, as well as on Facebook under the Big Ben and Friends podcast. You can find us on YouTube by searching the show name, just because again, we do not have enough subscribers yet to have an actual channel name yet. And I'm telling everybody this story just because it's fucking true, Mike. But if you actually look up Big Ben and Friends podcast on YouTube, you know how it'll suggest alternate things. It literally mm -hmm. says Big Ben, no friends. So it's, a, <laughs> it's like this gigantic rib that I need people to help me subscribe. Yeah, so let's I change not that. feel like an asshole anymore, you know? Um, <laughs> Find the audio version of this show on Anchor, which distributes the show to Spotify, iTunes, and literally anywhere else that you can hear a podcast, essentially. You can find me personally on all my social medias at Big Ben is Angry. Uh, you can find CBPW, Crossbody Pro Wrestling, and the Crossbody Pro Wrestling Academy on our social medias, which is all combined at CBPW Academy. We're on Twitter, Instagram. You can find us on Facebook as well. You can subscribe to the YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash Crossbody Pro Wrestling Academy. And there are a ton of amazing content on there and some featuring our, uh, our guest Speedball Mike Bailey. And please go back and watch that show that I was referring to earlier where you can just look up Mike Bailey versus Alessandro Del Bruno versus Tyler Thomas. You'll find it. It's on there. Now, um, you can also find us on independentwrestling.tv. Use the code CROSSBODY to get five free days if you haven't yet. And you can help us right now because all of that view time is how we get paid on independent wrestling TV. And that if you enter that code, we also get a small kickback. We're taking literally 100% of that money along with all of the money that we make on our Pro Wrestling Tees store right now during this month, which is prowrestlingtees.com slash crossbodyprowrestling, where all of the proceeds of the shirts that you see there for the most part, um, you'll see Madman Fulton. You'll see a Black Lives Matter shirt that was designed by uh, the, the black athletes that are on our crew. Uh, this shirt that you see right here, I'm putting mine up. Anything that you see with the Crossbody Pro Wrestling logo, essentially, 100% of the proceeds that month, we're combining all of that, and we are donating it to www.blacklivesmatter.ca, which is a group that, again, the, uh, the African-American gentlemen that are on our roster, they got together, and they decided that this is where they wanted the uh, funds to be allocated to. So, you know, we want to make sure that those funds go to where they're needed the most. And if that's where they want them to go, that's where they're going to go. You can find Speedball Mike Bailey at Speedball Bailey on Twitter and Instagram. Um, for anything else, I have matches on YouTube and independentwrestling.tv. How, you can can you? How can they support you on Pro Wrestling Tees? Um, I have my Pro Wrestling Tees store, but by a, a crossbody pro wrestling shirt that supports Black Lives Matter, that's more important. Yeah, you're not the first guy that says that. But I'm still putting your pro, your pro Wrestling Tees store in the description below so then that way people can go and support Speedball Mike Bailey. This is his job. This is his profession. So if we can help put some food on this man's table, we're just helping feed somebody who is, again, the goddamn best wrestler that's on this planet that is not on your TV every week. And with that being said, thank you very much for tuning into episode six of the Big Ben and Friends podcast. I can't thank you enough, Mike Bailey, for being a guest on my show this week. I hope that you can come back sometime. I hope that when wrestling comes back that we get the opportunity to kick one another real hard. And uh, we will see you guys next episode. Thank you. Thank you, buddy.